Welcome to Insight, today produced in collaboration with KCOS 13, El Paso Public Television. Today we are chatting with Anthony Tomaszewski, the Chief Executive Officer of Boys and Girls Club of El Paso. Tony has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. Thank you, Tony, for joining us today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure to be here. Boys and Girls Clubs is such a great national organization, but every single Boys and Girls Club has its own character. Talk about the El Paso version of the Boys and Girls Clubs. So, uh, absolutely. And the El Paso Boys and Girls Club has a very rich history. Actually, um, one of our current clubs, Club Penny, was established in 1929. And so, as far as we know, it is not the oldest Boys and Girls Club, but it's the oldest Boys and Girls Club that is active in its original building. So there has been a big, long, rich history of having Boys and Girls Club uh, here within our community. And who's, who established the, the Boys and Girls Clubs? Were, 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 was it family members? Was it? Uh, individuals within our community that, that felt a need and that understood and understood the vision and the mission of the Boys and Girls Club. And the tradition in El Paso has gone on for so long that in all honesty, we have current uh, club kids uh, children that were in our club that are now staff members. So they, they transition from one area of the club to the next. So for those of us who are not familiar with the mission of the Boys and Girls Clubs, talk about what that mission is and how that expresses itself in your various programs. So the mission of the Boys and Girls Club, our, our mission bottom line is to serve those who need it most. Uh, we focus on three specific areas. We want to make sure that we're building their academic areas, uh, we're building their leadership and uh, citizenship areas, and also working on uh, fitness and healthy lifestyles. Uh, those are three crucial components uh, for us. We're an after-school program, um, so basically we want to ensure that all kids have a safe place to go after school where we can work on each one of those aspects. Uh, the moment that the kids walk into our club, the first thing that they do uh, when they start their day with us is power hour. We wanna make sure that they're getting their homework done, that they have that assistance uh, from, from our staff, from individuals, so that the next day they're ready to start school successfully. Uh, once they've completed their homework, uh, following that, we wanna make sure we feed them. We know that uh, that's that's a big need in our community. That's, that's a big need for all kids to make sure that we're, we're meeting each one of those needs. And then once they're fed, we move into some other uh, fun, sports, different types of activities, depending on, on the interest of, of the children that are currently at the club. And so your programs have a number of different functions for civil society and for the citizenry here. You have parents who sometimes are both working, very often are both working. So this after-school program provides a secure environment in which the child can can uh, thrive, and, and you have in this environment socialization uh, processes, you have discipline, you have structure, you have help, tutorial help for, for homework. So particularly in, in multilingual families where perhaps the parents are not as conversant with the, uh, with the education system and, and the kinds of skills that are required for their children to thrive, those parents are actually depending on you to collaborate with them in, in helping their, their children to acquire those skills. Absolutely, uh, it's very common for the children to come to the club. And um, the majority of the, the population that we serve is about 96% Hispanic. Um, some of those kids are uh, newcomers. Uh, they're immigrants that are just here. And so not only are they adapting to new schools, but they're adapting to new languages and they're provided homework that's in English. And so it's a little bit of a struggle for them, but we have the staff that are there and help them and encourage them and, and make it fun and exciting. And it's, it's great to hear them progress and feel more comfortable. And truly, you know, our goal, uh, we wanna make sure that all the kids in our community are um, not only bilingual, but biliterate. So even those kids that don't speak Spanish within our clubs, uh, they're learning a little more Spanish. They're learning to interact. And we know that ultimately in the end, uh, the more children that are, that are biliterate, they're going to be more successful in the workplace. It's also shown that biliterate uh, children, children who can uh, not only speak, but also read and write in two languages, that, that those children actually have an advantage as they acquire new knowledge because their brains in grappling with these different languages those 
it, it actually teaches them skills that are really important as they go into the higher levels of schooling, as they get into high school and certainly into colleges and university where they might have to acquire a new language like math or a new language like chemistry or a new language like the medical sciences. So when you're looking at that, that linguistic ability, that is so important. It really is a competitive advantage for those children who participate in these types of programs. Uh, absolutely. And you, you are 100% correct. I mean, we realize that, that children that are biliterate will be more successful uh, in all areas, not, not only, as, as you mentioned, uh, academically in those, in those different college pursuits and learning new opportunities, but even, you know, aside from the academics of it all, just being a part of their community and being able to communicate with uh, multiple amounts of people and in their own native language. And I think that, you know, that's, that's the most important issue. It, you know, the expression lost in the translation, well, we want to make sure that our children, anytime they're engaged with any, any individual, that nothing is ever lost in the translation because they have the ability to communicate in whatever language is appropriate at they're the time. They're found in the translation. Absolutely. In terms of, you, uh, of the staff skills that are required, uh, that's another aspect that's so fascinating with boys and girls clubs. People sometimes don't realize, some, sometimes we, we forget that the, those skills of, of interacting with children and making them feel comfortable and then steadily and, and sometimes surreptitiously teaching lessons so that the children can embrace the, those are real skills as well. Plus you have some academic skills that, that uh, some of your staff uh, uh, require. So talk about um, your process for bringing people in, your, your process for vetting them, because of course it needs to be a safe environment, and what kind of skill sets do you have? Well, first let me tell you that the big secret that we all know is the reason why the kids continuously come to the club, not just because of the fun programming that we offer, but it's really the relationships that they build with the staff. Um, our staff members become secondary family to, to a lot of the children. And, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about parents that are, are working multiple jobs or working long hours trying to provide uh, for their children. And so the, these staff members are are those parents uh, for our children and on, on, on many, many different levels. Um, as, as far as the, the vetting and, and that piece of it, I mean, obviously we wanna make sure that the first thing we do is everyone passes a very extensive background check. Uh, that's unfortunate, but it, it's, it's the world we live in today. We've gotta make sure that we keep And it's Oliver. a criminal background check and there, there are other aspects that need to be also uh, vetted and checked as well. Absolutely, because the number one priority for our children is safety. So we wanna make sure that every child that walks through that door is safe. Um, and so we, we do do that. And then aside from that, we're really looking at individuals that, that have a passion for children and that really care and understand that what we do is not a clock in and clock out job. Yes. What we do is changing lives on a, on a daily basis and, and building those relationships. How does your funding work? The funding is, is the toughest issue of the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, first, let me tell you that the fee for the Boys and Girls Club in El Paso is $25 a year. And with that said, in all honesty, um, we have parents, um, unfortunately, you know, because of circumstance, can't afford the $25 a year. And truly, uh, my belief is if you can't afford $25 a year, you definitely need us. So we're going to make sure that we continue to, to service you. But even with that said, once we collect that, that $25 fee for those children, that doesn't even cover the cost of truly what we do. Um, on average, and depending on uh, specific programming, you're looking at a minimum at about uh, $500 per child. So most of everything that we do is, is grant funded. Um, and for anybody that knows anything about nonprofits, the, the struggle with that is that a lot of the grants are very restricted. And right. so when we're trying to find grants to uh, improve experiences for our kids, to provide different opportunities. It, it, it is a struggle in, in the nonprofit sector. In looking at your, at your funding, some comes from foundations. Um, do you get government funding? Honestly, we don't get enough. So those are, those are very big questions as far as how much. Uh, we do get some funding from the Office of Juvenile Justice. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that, is, that is a portion of our funding. But truly in El Paso, because 
of our specific needs. Our clubs are located in low income areas. I mean, they're, they're specifically located in areas where the, the children need us most. I mean, the 79901 a zip code, I believe is the fifth poorest zip code in Texas. And it's probably um, the last I looked about 173 within the nation. So, I mean, there there is a huge need for something. There's there's a huge need for support within our community. Uh, we you know we have kids that are that are not club kids that know that that we feed kids and say, hey, you know, can I come eat? Absolutely, come on in. Not only can you come eat, but join the club. You will help you with your homework. We'll you know we'll do all of these different things with you. Get you involved in a basketball league. But I mean, for some of those kids, they're just looking for those. That, that very minimal meal. What is next for the Boys and Girls Clubs of El Paso? Then the next piece for the Boys and Girls Club is we want to serve more children. I would really like for us to branch out to expand programming in, in different areas of El Paso. I will tell you that anybody that's ever been touched by the Boys and Girls Club and has been a club kid and has been a part of that process, it, it stays with them forever. I can't... Um, go anywhere. And the moment that people find out I'm associated with the Boys and Girls Club, they have a story. They were, they were a club kid. Um, we, we have an uh, alum association and they have some great stories as far as um, being uh, Boys and Girls Club Youth of the Year and going to the White House and meeting President Kennedy. So, I mean, even from the 60s, just some great stories. So, and the important thing for everyone to know is that it's uh, opening up new Boys and Girls Club facilities is a incredibly small investment compared to the benefit. What is that investment? It's a facility. The facility very often can be opened up at a very, very low price. And of course, there are, there are tax benefits uh, to doing that. The infrastructure that you have is completely scalable. You add some staff who will care for that facility, very often drawn from the local community, and all of a sudden you have a transformative experience for so many children in a neighborhood. That is the way to change El Paso over the years, and it's 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 a proven model. You've been doing it for almost 100 years at this point. Absolutely, and I think our community has an understanding of that. Uh, if we truly want to make a difference for this community, we have to start with our children, and that's the bottom line. Those children that, that need us most, that exposure to having a whole different, uh, just a whole different experience and an understanding of, of what it means to, to be a part of our community. And I think so much so that's why we have former club kids that want to come back and work and be staff members and be a part of that process because they know that it was, it was life-changing for them. And you know, ultimately, the, the biggest struggle for the Boys and Girls Club is not the services or the students we provide, it's the funding. And when I go to individuals in this community, I say there are a lot of great things that are happening in El Paso. You can contribute to, you know, the symphony, the art museum. There, there are many, many great, wonderful things. Um, but every dollar that comes to Boys and Girls Club, you're going to change a life forever. That's not, it's not a one-time gift and it's done because you've changed a life. Tony Tomaszewski, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Boys and Girls Clubs of El Paso. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for allowing me to be here. It's truly an honor.